Hi, everybody, and welcome to Big Joe's Journal. Well, here we are in uh, November, and uh, like every November, you got your sunny days and cold weather. And we've just survived a uh, huge fall storm, if you will. And apparently in this area, we were sort of between two belts as they got hit a lot harder up around the northern part of the state, especially up in uh, Chittenden County and Franklin County, New Orleans County, and up in the Northeast Kingdom and down below us, down around uh, Bennington and uh, Brattleboro, Bellas Falls, that area. So once again, being in between two areas, I think we lucked out. We are between two snow belts. As they usually have more snow north of us and then more snow south of us. Usually you get up around, uh, talk about a snow belt. It's usually between Pittsford and Brandon that you see a difference in snow. There's more snow uh, north of us until you, uh, well, probably get up around Ferrisburg or Charlotte. And uh, there, the lake effect from Lake Champlain delays the onset of winter just a little bit uh, coming into Chittenden County. And by the same token, toward, as we get into spring, they're more apt to have snow than we are because, again, the lake effect, uh, it's snow generated by the cold air over the lake that uh, comes in and affects Franklin and uh, North Chittenden County. But we lucked out on this storm. Well, talking on a uh, more pleasant venue, if you will, let, let's talk a little bit about high school football with the championships coming down this Saturday. And uh, two schools, well, now let me see now. Um, I think four schools where I've taught driver ed at one time or another are all involved in championship play this weekend, which will take place at Alumni Field up at Rutland High School. Uh, in Division Three, it's going to be Poultney and uh, BFA of Fairfax. Again, I spent 21 years teaching driver ed at Poultney, and I spent one summer doing a summer program up at uh, BFA in Fairfax. During the regular season, Fairfax beat Poultney six to nothing, but uh, because Fairfax got beat by Otter Valley, that had been hammered by Poultney, Poultney is the number one seed. Fairfax number two, it'll all be a rematch at Alumni Field, and I'm not sure which game it's gonna be. The uh, Division Two, I spent three years at Bellows Falls, and they are back in the Division Two finals. This time, they're going to be playing their next door neighbor in Wyndham County, Brattleboro. And Brattleboro went through undefeated and defeated Bellows Falls in the regular season. I believe it was 49 to 26 was the final score. So they're going to have a rematch at Alumni Field because that was the first game of the season and. Dallas Falls has improved quite a bit since then. And the Division I game will be between Burr and Burton, where I taught for a number of summers, and uh, St. Johnsbury Academy, which is coached by the first football coach at Castleton University. Uh, after he left Castleton, um, a year or two later, he wound up uh, building a football program at St. Johnsbury Academy. And he's done a great job. They have one state title, one runner-up, and now they're going to try for their second state title. During the regular season, St. Johnsbury defeated Burn Burton 50-38. to And Burn Burton was Division II up until this year. They came into Division I, everybody wondered how they were going to do. Well, they virtually with a high-powered offense, they virtually blew some of these uh, Division I schools, you know, off the field. And they've gone into the finals by defeating Hartford, which is a traditional power in Division I. In fact, they routed them. I think it was something like 49 to 29. Middlebury, which was undefeated all season, um, Middlebury was favored and Burn Burton went up and beat them 54 to 39. So a rematch, Division I, between St. Johnsbury and Burn Burton. Well, let's turn to uh, the national scene. 
You know, the New England Patriots lost their first game of the season last night. They're now 8-1. and one. They uh, pretty well got manhandled by the uh, Baltimore Ravens. You know, Baltimore jumped out to a 17-0 lead, and they managed to maintain a lead all through the game. The Pats came close a couple times, but never quite got up. They came within, within four points at the start of the fourth quarter, but then uh, Baltimore turned the heat on again and won it 37-20. to 20. So the Pats are 8-1. And, and baseball. Well, I think what happened this year in the World Series is good for baseball. At the beginning of the year, if anybody had said the Washington Nationals were going to wind up as world champions in 2019, I think you would have been laughed off the, uh, laughed off the surface of the earth. At one time, this team was in the cellar, the National League East. But they made a few deals here and there. They, they got their act together. They came back. They finished second to Atlanta in the National League East. They uh, won the play-in game over Milwaukee, went on to knock off top-seeded Dodgers. They blew out the St. Louis Cardinals, who had upset the Atlanta Braves. They blew them out in four straight. And they went into the World Series as heavy underdogs. In fact, a lot of people, including yours truly, thought Houston would probably sweep them in four straight, but it didn't work out that way. The strange thing about this World Series is that the visiting team won all seven games. Washington went into Houston, took the first two in Houston. Series came back to Washington, and Houston took the three that were played in Washington to take a 3-2 lead. Go back to Houston, everybody said, well, Houston's going to wrap it up. They won three in a row, they're going to wrap it up. Didn't happen that way. As you know, Washington won game six and seven, and they are the 2019 uh, baseball world champions. They're also the oldest team in Major League Baseball. They had a few youngsters thrown in, like um, their left fielder there, uh, Dominique Soto, whose 21st birthday occurred during the World Series. Well, other than that, the majority of their uh, players are in their early to mid-30s, which in baseball is old. Not from my point of view, where I'm standing or living, but in terms of uh, baseball, you get into your 30s, you're considered to be a veteran or an old man. And uh, <clears throat> the Nationals put together a few deals. They got the right combination. You know, it's like putting together a picture puzzle. And you get the right pieces in the right spot, the whole thing falls together. The owner of the Washington Nationals is 94 years old. And uh, had to be a great thrill for him at his age uh, to be the owner of baseball's world champions. Well, this team of Nationals is, is the third major league team that the city of Washington has had. The first one were known as the Senators, the Washington Senators. And they last won a World Series in, uh, in 1924, which was 95 years ago. The second time they went to the World Series, 1933, and they lost to the New York Giants, who are now the San Francisco Giants. That team was owned by the Griffin family, or Griffith, G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H. Clark Griffith, who was a multimillionaire, was the owner of that ball club. Well, when he died, the uh, new owners purchased the team from the, uh, from the Griffith family, and they moved the, that franchise from Washington out to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And so that Washington Senators ball club are now the Minnesota Twins. Well, after they left, an expansion team was created for Washington. 
but they never really got off the ground. You know, they're they pretty much uh, the league doormat. And so the owners of that team, because they, you know, the idea of these guys going to baseball, <clears throat> it's not because they love the sport, although there is a love of the sport there. But the primary reason is to make a profit. It's a business. And they weren't making what they thought they should be. And so they took that Washington Senator team and they moved that to Dallas, Texas. And that team is now the Texas Rangers. The team that are the Washington Nationals came from Montreal. They were the Montreal Expos, an expansion team uh, that came in existence about the same time, well, surprisingly, at the same time as the Houston, no, it wasn't the Houston Astros. Um, the Astros and the New York Mets came in at the same time. And uh, I'm trying to think who Montreal came in. I think Montreal came in the same time as San Diego, the San Diego Padres. But they were the Montreal Expos, and they had some, some fairly good ball clubs in Montreal. But the big sport in Montreal, of course, is hockey. <clears throat> and uh, with an opening in Washington and, and the uh, Major League Baseball really wanting a Major League team in the nation's capital, <clears throat> the uh, Montreal Expos moved to Washington and they became the Washington Nationals. And they are the 2019 uh, baseball world champions. Well, as we're celebrating November here, um, two big holidays come up in November. First one, of course, is Armistice Day, or Veterans Day as we, we call it now. Years ago, when I was quite a bit younger than I am now, Armistice Day was more or less the concluding holiday of the summer season. That honor now goes to Halloween with that big Halloween parade. But on Armistice Day, the city had a big parade. And the big attraction on that day was a football game between Rutland High School and MSJ. And of course, over the years, Rutland High School, the Red Raiders, dominated the city series. There were a number of ties in there. I think there were two or three ties. But overall, <clears throat> Rutland dominated. And that held true right up till 1946. On an armistice day that was a bit chilly, rainy, muddy. Game played up at Flights Field, which is now the, uh, the field behind what is now Rutland Middle School and Rutland Elementary School and everything else. Uh, that was Flights Field. And it was MSJ and Rutland, and MSJ defeated Rutland for the first time by a score of 12 to 6. A kid by the name of Funzi Chaffee scored both MSJ touchdowns. 1946, a lot of the kid, guys playing high school football had returned from serving in the military in World War II. And it was particularly the case with MSJ. Uh, Funzi Chaffee was probably one of the youngest members of that team. But many of these guys had, had been in the Army or been in the Navy and served World War II. And so it was kind of a veteran team. The way the thing was set up, if you hadn't completed your four years of high school football eligibility uh, and you went back to school to get your diploma because many, many went into the military before they graduated, they were eligible to play football. And so it was kind of a veteran team that MSJ put on the field. The year before, in 1945, at St. Peter's Field, Rutland had defeated MSJ two to nothing on a safety. Um, MSJ, again, it was Funzie Chaffee, scored touchdown, but was called back because of an offside penalty against MSJ. At the final result was, of course, uh, Rutland winning on a safety and uh, 
I forget, I think it was, maybe it was Funzy too, was tackling the end zone, which gave Rutland their two points. Rutland won that one two to nothing. LMSJ won their first win, 12 to six. Their second win would come in 1949, 20 to nothing. And then they'd go into a slight drought. But then come the late 50s, the 60s, the early 70s, MSJ dominated. Until, up until, uh, well, after the year 2000, when things begin to change and the enrollment of MSJ begin to drop and the Monties were no longer competitive. And very sadly, the Rutland MSJ series came to an end. The, there are some still long-standing series going on, but they, they um, really don't, didn't have the momentum of the Rutland MSJ game. That was usually the last game of the, that was the, uh, was the last game of the year. And then, of course, in the uh, late 60s and 70s, they decided to determine a state championship by having the playoffs. And you had your two top teams in the south and two top teams in the north, and and MSJ dominated that particular series for a while. The first time they had a playoff series, MSJ lost to Burlington up at Centennial Field, 20 to 14. And then they began their run for a series of, of state titles by beating Burlington, I think, in game five, which was played at Bellis Falls. And MSJ uh, returned the favor and beat Burlington by the same, well, wait a minute, no, wait a minute, it was 19 to 16, Burlington beat MSJ. And MSJ turned around and beat Burlington 20 to 14 in the fifth game. Altogether, Mount St. Joseph won 16, 16 state titles. And of course, that is a legacy that, due to circumstances and the way the situation is now, will never return. But Armistice Day, a big football game, Rutland MSJ, a big parade in the morning. And it usually began up Main Street Park and went down West Street and down Merchant Stroll and uh, then up East Washington Street and back through the park over to the Rutland Armory where they had their speeches and all that sort of thing. Then there was a procession led by the Rutland City Band down to West Street Cemetery and they would lay a wreath on one of the graves, and <clears throat> that was it till kickoff time, which was around one o'clock in the afternoon. And it alternated back and forth, one year at St. Peter's Field, the other year up at uh, Flights Field at the high school. Well, that is all ancient history now. Veterans Day originally signaled the end of World War I. World War I was known as the Great War. And the motto was it was fought, the war was fought to end all wars. But war is never a solution. And what one war does is plant the seeds for another war. The war began in 1914 with the assassination of the Archduke, the Austrian Archduke Ferdinand, by a uh, individual in Sarajevo which now was part of Yugoslavia. And uh, at that time, Austria and Hungary were joined together as one nation. And uh, it, was the, um, it was the Habsburg nobility family that uh, ruled that particular section of the world. And the Archduke was the heir to the phone, or heir to the throne. I got it, the heir to the throne. And he was assassinated in Sarajevo by an anarchist. And as a result, that would trigger World War I because there were a number of alliances that were set up. Um, Russia was an ally, or no, wait a minute. Austria-Hungary was an ally of Germany. Germany had become a United Nation in 1870, less than 100 years old at that time, and they were still a very, very warlike nation. Well, once the Archduke was assassinated, 
And Germany came to the military support of, Aust of Hungary, Austria. On the other side of the fence, France was, was very, very nervous about the rise of German militarism, especially since Germany had defeated France in the War of 1870, requested help, and they requested help from their ally, Britain. Italy was worried about a military intervention from Austria-Hungary, so they joined France and Britain. And on the other side, Russia, which had pledged to uh, support uh, countries just outside of Hungary and Austria, uh, joined the alliance with Britain, France, and Italy. Well, the Ottoman Empire was afraid of being annihilated. That was, that was Turkey, so forth. So they allied themselves with Germany and Austria-Hungary. And thus the stage was set for World War I. And that assassination triggered it off. And the world was pretty much a stalemate. A lot of people were dying, a lot of killing going on. A uh, sense of modern warfare, for the first time, involved aircraft. They were used as um, mainly for observation. They didn't have the very modern fighter planes that we have now. <coughs> the, um, usually, a fighter plane, the pilot would have a pistol. And they'd go up, and if you had what the so-called dogfight, They'd be firing pistols back and forth at each other. Well, Germany, who was always very, very inventive, uh, came up with the ability to mount a machine gun on a plane. And that made their air force and their air attack very, very effective. Previous to that, if you put a machine gun on a plane, it shot off the propeller blades. And the plane would, boom, crash. That would be it. Among the great... German war heroes was an aviator for the first time in history, and that was the Red Baron. And he was a baron. He was of uh, German nobility. He was Prussian. And uh, he organized the early version of the Luftwaffe, which was Germany's uh, air force. And one of his young lieutenants that served under him in World War I was a man named Hermann Goring. As you know, Goring would become a close ally of Adolf Hitler and would be the leader of the Luftwaffe in World War II. Well, the war began in 1914 when the Germans began by invading Belgium. And from there they swept down into France. And you got into trench warfare. Neither side was gaining. They were losing a lot. Casualties were high. In 1917, the United States came to the rescue of the Allies. An American expeditionary force under the command of General John Pershing, Black Jack Pershing, went to France to come to the, come to the aid of the Allies. Well, they were able to put uh, men over there. We didn't have the materials that we needed, so consequently, a number of French tanks, as tank warfare was beginning to develop in World War I, a number of French tanks were loaned to the United States for use of our expeditionary force. My late father-in-law was a machine gunner on that expeditionary force that went over to France. And uh, it was trench warfare. The trenches were very dirty, very filthy. They were rat infested, a lot of diseases. The great flu epidemic, which killed millions of people worldwide in 19... 1918, 1919, 1920, 
started in the trenches of World War I. I know my father-in-law was gassed. The Germans used gas, both sides used gas in those days. But he also came back from the war with a lot of uh, souvenirs, which they were allowed to bring back. They picked off the bodies of dead German soldiers, German Iron Cross, and other. Uh, uh, one thing he brought back was the Luger pistol, which German officers carried. But World War I finally came to an end. Germany, pretty well beaten. The Ottoman Empire had been pretty well destroyed by British and French expeditionary forces. The war was a lot more successful in the Middle East from the Allies' point of view than it was from the Axis powers. And Germany, well, they were virtually cut off. And so both sides were tired of war. During the course of the war, the uh, Red Baron had been shot down, and not by Snoopy, but by a Canadian pilot who had somehow or another outmaneuvered the Red Baron and shot his plane down. Well, the Red Baron, where he landed, where he crash landed, and it was probably the crash landing that killed him, behind Allied lines, and it happened to be a, a uh, contingent from Australia, military unit from Australia. But what they did, even though this guy was part of the enemy, they gave him a military funeral, and they notified the Germans that the Red Baron had crashed and had died, and he was buried with very, very high military honors. One thing that uh, was a bit unusual about World War I, here these guys were fighting each other, killing each other, but on Christmas Eve, I believe in 1917, there was a truce. And because Christmas Eve, they came out of their trenches, and they visited with each other and talked with each other and had a merry Christmas Eve. Then they went back in their trenches and started killing each other. But both sides were, <clears throat> were pretty well exhausted by war. Both wanted peace. So by mutual agreement, on November 11th, they met in a rail car at the town of Reims, France. And at the 11th hour, on the 11th month, an armistice was signed, ending hostilities in World War I. Well, as I said at the start, World War I was fought with the idea it would be the war to end all wars. But what it did was sow the seeds of the wars we even have now. The peace treaty that the Allies drew up at Versailles uh, was very, very hard on Germany. The German Kaiser, while not arrested, he had to go into exile, and he went in exile into Holland. And that's where he died, Kaiser Wilhelm, Wilhelm II. The British royal family, which was German, changed their name to Windsor. Became the House of Windsor. Actually, they were from Hanover, Germany, uh, coming, beginning with George I. He was a German prince at Hanover, and uh, he came to England. Parliament invited him to England to uh, assume the throne. And they maintained their German name right up until the start of World War I, when uh, King George V uh, changed their name to, uh, it was Hohenzollern, and changed their name to Windsor. Well, with that, we come to the end of another program. 
Uh, since a week from now is going to be Armistice Day or Veterans Day, we'll see you in two weeks. May Almighty God and His infinite wisdom continue to bless these United States of America. God love you, and have a great two weeks.